All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to today's session. Um, today, we're going to talk about top secrets of successful traders, and that can certainly mean quite a bit of things. Um, we have a packed agenda today. We're going to go over really some some epic successful traders, some of their comments or keys to success and really analyze that in comparison to the market, some of our, our future disruptors, if you will, and really talk about what it takes to be a successful tra trader, what we can learn from history, how can we translate that to today? So there's certainly a lot of information in there. Um, and I see we've got so many people from everywhere. So thank you for, for commenting that. It's always great to see people from all over the world joining these sessions. So Keep it coming. That, that's certainly great. Um, and some things that you guys may not know about me and a little bit of my background that can help offer really a, a different flavor of this is when I, I spent a lot of time at Merrill or even at Fidelity, um, part of my job was analyzing complaints or talking to clients when they uh, made really bad mistakes. And I also had a job at one point where I worked with a lot of executives. You had to have it, at least a, a million dollars to work with me from a self-directed perspective. And I learned a lot from all of those experiences because essentially I was in a position where if you did something that caused the entire firm to freak out, where um, there was risk associated with it, I understood and learned a lot of lessons from that in addition to talking to those clients. And that to me is, is a little invaluable um, and something that that you may find interesting and something I, I don't think I've shared either is, um, you know, in order to join Options Play, I had to give up my financial licenses because Options Play is not a registered as a broker dealer. But of course, I've spent my entire career utilizing those licenses. But that's something that I think is interesting um, and something we're noticing with the transformation of the industry and something we can certainly talk about later. And so that's just important to be cognizant of if you are on the Internet and you are searching the words top secrets of a successful trader, and you come across that, um, there are things you should be careful of and of who you're talking to and who's giving you that information due to the huge regulatory environment that is finance. So there's certainly some interesting stuff there, but I, I thought that was a piece of my background that I will share with you to tell you where this really derived from and certainly a lot of information. Um, all right, so let's dive into it. I do have to start with a quick disclaimer as per usual. Um, no, we're not gonna go into really trade examples today. Um, uh, love that, former licenses yourself. Um, but know that there, there are some securities that are gonna be displayed because we are going to look at the market. So that is for demonstration purposes only. The, any information that we're giving you today is not constitute an advice or recommendation. You should always talk to a tax advisor or a financial advisor um, whenever fully encompassing your strategy. So nonetheless, let's get started. So I wanted to start with the pioneers. So when I, when I think of the pioneers, first who comes to mind is definitely Warren Buffett, um, which I'm sure we all know who this man is, um, chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. He's invested since 1941, since he was 11. That's when he purchased his first stock. So that's the date that we assigned to him as far as when he started investing. So we're going to go through some of the information that he said, his quotes, how it was applicable, and look at that through time. Second one is Dennis Gartman. Um, you probably see him on CNBC as well. He is an economist. He is a capital markets expert. So he's got some information and some quotes that we're going to go through as far as the pioneers are concerned. And then Bob Farrell. So Bob Farrell, unfortunately, is no longer with us, but he was the head of research over at Merrill, and he's been investing since 57. And he's famous for the Farrell rules. That's something if you attended our market playbook a while back, there are 10 Farrell rules, and he is really a technical analyst, if you will, and some of the pioneers of technical analysis. And a lot of those rules are applicable today and that's something that's that's important to go through now what i want you to what we're going to do is is look for a rhyme or an echo and apply that with the rules of investing that these three pioneers have laid out and mind you these aren't the only people that we're going to look at but what i want you to think of and this is what we're going to focus on with trading is right now 
um, and really within the last progression of technology as retail investors have entered into the trading space, a lot of times the marketing message or what's driven is be passive. Being passive to me um, is certainly complacency and complacency is my worst enemy. If I feel comfortable, then I'm not growing. That's the way I feel about investing and the way that I really position my life in every aspect, if you will. So, so complacency is something to be cognizant of, um, but active investing, or excuse me, passive investing is what's really marketed. That's something that you hear when you're first starting investing is, oh, just put your money in the S&P 500, leave it and go, or your work perhaps gives you a 401k, and then you end up in some type of target dated fund of some sort, which is a form of active passive investing because of the way the mutual fund is structured, but you're not involved as much. Passive just is set it and forget it. And that certainly has its value and something that has um, will give you an edge with passive investing is time. And we'll talk about that as well. But I want to focus, and then this is really where the pioneers are, is that 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 passive piece. And that passive piece takes about 40 to 50 years. But technology is really, really different since we have been taught to be passive with our investments. And I want to talk about that. And if the shift then is really moved to being active. And that's where you have your active traders. And that's where you're trying to time the market and, and figure things out. And that's really difficult to do as well. And that's certainly not the solution. And that's why well, I'll share another backstory. Working at another brokerage firm, I worked on an active trader desk. And um, therefore, I talked to so many active traders. I learned so much. That was one of my, my biggest learning experiences out of any job I've ever had. And I am forever thankful for it, for the what I learned from clients and the people around me. But what I saw was people blow up their accounts a lot. I have never really seen a successful active trader. By active trader, I mean day trading. Um, I'm, I'm yet to spot that one. And that, and mind you, working on the other side, especially when I was at other firms in a position of running strategy, I would run analysis on every account and I knew where that demographic was. I would see where their money was shifting and nine times out of 10, one, if they are active trading, it was their fun account or their play account. And that's where options came in as well. So where I wanna shift your focus is passive, has its time and place, but that's not you being involved. Active is, Involvement, that's what it is. But what we're going to focus on is being engaged, being understanding and really getting the keys to success in implementing your strategy, learning from the pioneers, learning from the disruptors, which we'll go through, and then putting that all together and the access that you have available. And this is also going to be a presentation where it's not you, you don't even have to be an options trader for this to be applicable. It's applicable to investing as a whole and they designed it as such. And there's just some great information in here. So nonetheless, these are our pioneers that we're going to focus on first. Besides them all being older white gentlemen, um, they do have a lot more in common. So we'll start with Warren Buffett. Number one rule he has is never lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. Um, and what he really means there is he personally lost, it was in the um, financial crisis of 08, about $23 billion. And what he's saying is, is that's mindset. It's not, oh, don't go in. Um, like, you're not going to lose. You're not going to lose. It's prepare for it. Do your homework is what he means. He means know your surroundings, know what the company does. And that's where it comes down to your strengths and amplifying them is the way that I interpret this, especially going through his processes. He doesn't gamble, he's calculated. And today we have so much technology available to us. This man started investing since 1941. And one of the keys to his wealth was compound interest and starting out very, very small, planting that seed and growing since he was 11 years old. Good on him. Some of us may not have started that early, um, my son personally has started since he was uh, he was four, four years old. He bought his first stock. Um, but that, that's because I, I'm his mother and this is what I do for a living. And that's something we talk about. And I want to make sure he's got that time component. And now we're working on the mindset component and things of that nature and how to actually pick stocks now that he's in middle school and we can 
talk about valuation. But this is what Warren Buffett means is you don't gamble. You don't go in knowing you're going to lose. You flip the picture and you have done your homework knowing that the risk reward profile is in your favor. So there are a lot of brokerage firms out there, so many brokerage firms. There is on every single one of them, a security profile. Some put them together in different ways. There's also analyst opinions. So whenever you are choosing an underlying security or you wanna invest in something, do your homework first. If you don't wanna read through a balance sheet and understand profit margins, you don't have to anymore. There are analyst ratings. You can literally pull up in any stock, every brokerage firm has them, go to the ratings. There's normally three to five major ones. Some even compile them together. And that will give you an, a, they'll give you the uh, analyst ratings normally give you a buy, hold, sell, neutral recommendation, and even a price target. That is all the fundamental analysis done for you. Technical analysis is a different story, but if you know the heart of technical analysis, technical analysis believes that that fundamental aspect is built in. However, all of that's been a little debunked lately due to uh, the influx of retail trading and, and meme stocks, if you will. It's all supply and demand and um, the younger generation, I love what they do, banding together can push prices of securities up or down. And those are things we can talk about as well. But in regard to rule number one, that just means do your homework. And that's really, really, really simple. When you are making a decision, especially one with your money, but any decision whatsoever, think about all of the possible outcomes, but you make that decision, I am sure, doing your homework. If you're choosing what college to send your kid to, you are looking through um, what location it's at and making sure they have everything. Is that at the ratings? Is this going to be the network that he needs? Or even it's as simple as when you buy a car, you're probably doing a comparison. You know how many miles per gallon you need or things like that. Literally, those are all decisions. And anytime you make a decision, you do that by doing your homework and utilizing the resources around you. It's, it's really that simple, rule number one. Number two, it's far better, better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price than a fair company at a, wonder, or at a uh, wonderful price. And that's because Warren Buffett is um, historically or notoriously a value investor. That's where um, it's almost contrarian in a way. He looks for companies, a, a value company or a value stock is more of a growth stock. So it's undervalued. And so it has more promise for potential. And he would notoriously look for companies with efficiencies, as in if they counted how many paper towels they used. And his theory is if you are a manager where you're counting the amount of paper towels that you're using, you are accounting for every intricate detail of your business Therefore, you're managing it well and you are doing your homework just like I pick my stocks. So that's a valuable company where it will grow and make success over time. Um, so that, that, that's an extremely important part is just having that process. But also you can look for value stocks. That's what he's done. But we're going to talk about how that compares from when he's been investing and growing his wealth. Um, versus when, uh, you know, the time that we're in, that it's certainly really different. Um, we tend to even start our jobs with more debt lately, but we also have access to more technology too. So I want to talk about that and make sure that this is applicable to today, to today and what we can pull from these pioneers to make it applicable for today. Next on Dennis Gartman, we won't spend as much time on him, but he has a great, great, great quote. Being patient with winning trades, being enormously impatient with losing trades. Remember, it's quite possible to make large sums of investing if we're right only 30% of the time, as long as our losses are small and our profits are large. So that is risk reward. And that is definitely still applicable today. And that's the way we teach um, for options trading, but it's also applicable for stocks. So from an investing and growing your wealth perspective, brokerage firms are going to say, save for a goal, you know, if you wanna, you wanna save for your, your home, save for retirement, you want a vacation, something of that nature. And, that, and that's great. 
having that focus in mind, but you should also save for unexpected expenses and things like that as well. But now when it comes to the trading aspect, being enormously impatient with losing trades, that means having an exit strategy. This again equates to emotion and decision-making with clarity and calculation. When I'm placing a trade, so you the, let's go back to what, what Warren Buffett said and say we just apply his methodology. So we know that we're gonna we're gonna start as quickly as possible because that's what he taught us, and we can grow our wealth over time with compound interest. We're doing our homework when picking our securities, and we're not mitigating the little guy because there's growth potential. Now, if we do invest in the growth potential, but it doesn't go our way enough where it could really affect us, that is called an exit strategy. And that happens when you're trading, so that that's different from investing, if you will. You have to close out that position on the downside. You can do that by stop losses. It's an order you can place on your brokerage firm for a stock and usually single-legged options where you just say, hey, I want to sell it if it drops to this price, and that will just automatically happen. It's a great way to keep you disciplined. But what Dennis Gartman is teaching us is you be impatient with your losses, as in stop the bleeding, let it go, um, and be patient with winning trades as well. Um, and we can see how that's applicable today, especially analyzing the market. I think that's, that's, that's really important. But what this also tells me is if you look at a normal distribution curve and standard deviations and study the math, Matic side of backtesting trades, you can take it out to the small sides of the distribution curve, meaning sometimes really small trades, maybe even like he says 30%, but it actually equates to smaller numbers, even 5% sometimes can make up your large gains. And that's an important component as well. Um, but doing your homework is, is, is um, definitely up there. Moving on to Bob Farrell. So now this is the technical analysis side. They're called the Farrell Rules. If you don't know them, you can literally Google them. Bob Farrell's 10 Rules for Investing. I just pulled out two. All 10 are really, really great. Um, first is fear and greed are stronger than long-term resolve. And that's true because emotion is something that is easily something we can give in to. Very easy to give in to. Um, and if you think about when you fall or any time you've had a challenge in your life and you can't get back up, whatever that is, I'm not even talking trading. And maybe it is a trade where you had a, a huge trade and, and it was lost and you're like, you know what? I can't do this. Throw in the towel. Um, or maybe it was a big decision in your life or a big promotion you were trying to get. That fear can overtake you. And on the other side, greed can overtake you, meaning you need a humbling moment. Um, and the key is long-term resolve. You need to get back, overcome that stronger feeling and have resilience. Resilience, I think, is one of the, the biggest keys to success. And there's a way we can even equate this to, to personal life with you know who you surround yourself with is who you're a mirror of, but that's really what you read every day and what you're working on. And, and that mindset is extremely important and focus. And again, making decisions calmly, quickly, with clarity and calculated. I'll, I'll say that quite often. The second quote I wanted to pull from Bob is when all experts and forecast agree, something else is going to happen. And that is, um, if you study what he says for bear markets, I think that's interesting as well and certainly something of note. But when everyone agrees and you follow the crowd, that sometimes is the exhaustion point. And we call that in the market capitulation. So there's a lot, you, you probably hear that now where we're talking about, oh, we're in a bear market. This is a bear market rally. We haven't capitulated. And that's when um, basically everyone agrees, hey, you know, we're at the bottom or we're done or we're not going anywhere. We're smooth, sa smooth sailing. That just means to be alert. <laughs> that's all that simply means is Again, complacency is your worst enemy. If you feel like everything is smooth, that's probably not the case. And you always have to just be cognizant of worst case scenario, which is just being prepared, having a really great risk to reward profile, which we'll talk about, and having that focus and resilience and taking the emotion out of what you do. Now, 
we've gone through the white men and the pioneers of investing. Um, let's talk about innovation. And I think this is really important when we focus on those pioneers. And mind you, they have some wonderful, wonderful, valuable tips that are absolutely still applicable today. But online trading has evolved, especially as of late. I tried very hard to pull data as far as the growth of retail accounts, but I can tell you it's breaking systems, which is which is amazing. As individual investors, we have access to the stock market now. We have access to real-time data, which means the market can react really, really quickly. And volatility has increased as such because of that reaction time. And so that means it's so much easier to be caught up in your emotions and fall down into that hole of fear where everyone is. And that's something that I, I just want you to think about. So 1969 is when the first internet-based tr internet trading was introduced. Um, probably was a big room full of lots of computers. The NASDAQ was established only in 1971. So um, the NASDAQ is just listed equities, more on the tech sector and some finance there. 1975, we have a first derivatives market from Amex. Um, but the first, what I want to point out here, not going through all of them, is the first online discount broker. And I don't think the uh, name of it was E-Trade. Um, at the time. However, it was created in 1995. Now, pri prior to 1995, there was direct-to-consumer trading via the telephone, and there was Merrill's um, street edge system and things like that. However, before it was actually on the World Wide Web for people to start accessing began in 1995. Now, if we go back and think about those pioneers who were investing, they were investing well before that time. All of them are probably a, a little bit around here. And that's something to be interesting of, or, or be, to really think about. This chart, and if you know anything about charting, is an arithmetic chart. Normally, when you show the S&P 500 back from 1925 until present, or any chart back that far, you'll switch it to a logarithmic. That way, it's Takes an, it's very difficult right here to see the growth because it's zero to 500. And so you change it more to percentages because there was certainly a lot of growth here. And this is an, an inaccurate picture because it's arithmetic, not logarithmic. But I did that on purpose because the integration of technology has made things vastly different because now the market isn't largely institutional, it's more retail we have more access to information quicker than ever. And it's still constantly changing because it's a competitive marketplace. We first had E-Trade, we have Robinhood now, Charles Schwab, Merrill, and uh, uh, so Fidelity, so many that are out there that have their strengths and weaknesses, but they're competing with each other for the consumer's market share. And they're doing that by making sure they have a holistic platform for their target client, whomever that may be, which means they're really focusing and trying to be customer centric on their specific target client um, with creating those type of experiences. And that means it's easier for you and I to consume data. And that's the purpose of options play is literally taking options data in a consumable format. But your firm probably does that already and the internet does that already. And I think that means we have an advantage, but it's also different than the old passive investing. That's where active investing certainly was born is around this era. And then of course, now we're in, or we're talking about being engaged. So let's look at, at this chart. So this is, I pulled from the Options Clearing Court and SIBO, but the annual options volume. And I think this is important as well, just to prove my point of how much things have changed. Very little but so much more now that we've gotten to 2021. And that was breaking records due to COVID. Um, people were at home and bored and maybe perhaps missing casinos or, or gaming. And then there was this push for gamification. And then all of a sudden that, that um, caused regulation and things like that. And I think that's important to know when we're looking at the 
um, S and P 500 overall. That's something I missed from that, or not missed, but I left out of that diagram because having the history of the entire market is, um, we'll need a couple slides for that. But anytime something happens in the market, because the, the purpose of the SEC and FINRA and the responsibility of your brokerage firms and those who are licensed is to ensure the safety and the access to markets to all. So if something happened, like the easily comes to mind is, is the, uh, the housing collapse. People were getting mortgages that had no business doing it. Hence, regulation comes in with tighter constraints and things of that nature. So that has also been tightening, changing other things within the market. So that's important to know as well. And then this is fun for my SEO friends out there is um, the rising of the retail trader and how much it's changed. And this is just Google trending topics. So day trading, option strategies, swing trading, trading strategy. This That's a huge spike over time. It's people who are just looking for the keys to success for to define that. So we've, we've got to think about some of the pioneers that are out there um, and how we can apply that to today. So I think that leads us to what I like to call the disruptors. So I threw uh, Tom Sosnoff on there. If you guys um, you know, are a member of Options Play. I'm sure you know who Tom Sosnoff is. Um, and we all learned options trading from him. And he was a disruptor in the fact that he took that risk. He built an amazing platform for us, Thinkorswim, um, and then started Tasty Trade and decided financial education should be free to all. And he was a disruptor that way. Um, options trading was something that scares people because that word set says complexity and that's that mindset and that's fear that you have to overcome with education um and he he was the one who said hey you know what i learned so much i am going to take that risk and i'm just going to give you guys education and he did and that that is certainly a disruptor within the marketplace i put our very own rick ben senior on there as well he um, has been investing for a very long time but he was a contrarian Sometimes when he, um, he told me a story that I hope it's okay, I share where he, um, when he was working for another firm and he took an opposing position on a security and he was the first one who did that um, within the history of that company. And it was a very big blue chip electric company and that contrarian approach. And that was just him staying true to his values and doing his homework and not following the crowd. And so there is a common theme with these disruptors to the pioneers. That is extremely important. So I think there is a lot that we can learn from them as well. So let's let's go to Tom. If you've watched Tom ever or anyone on Tasty Trade, you will hear them say trade small, trade often. And that definitely equates to what some of the pioneers have said as well. That's slow growth over time. And that's also risk assessment and risk awareness. So something that we teach here at Options Play and every firm you're at will teach you risk tolerance and asset allocation and things of that nature. But in order to be successful from a risk adverse perspective, going in, doing your homework, a portion of it is not putting all your eggs in one basket. And that doesn't mean diversify across a bunch of different sectors. That is one part of it, sure. But it also means if you spend 90% of your account on one trade, well, you're setting yourself up for failure because if that one trade is your bad trade, you're not allowing enough decisions to educate yourself. You have the luxury of technology to educate yourself, but if you put yourself in a terrible situation by, by trading, this is different than those passive investing then you are going to set yourself up for failure. So he believes in trade small, trade often. And that doesn't mean only do 2%. That means one trade is 2% of your portfolio. So you can do a ton of trades um, and there are lots of options. And that's the purpose of stock splits. So we had Tesla split very recently. And the purpose of, top, of stock splits is to attract investors to buy more because it's gotten too expensive. And it's part of that making it available to all and that supply demand aspect. And it does push the stock up a little bit. Um, another common saying of Tom's is no high fives. And that is, I find an interesting one. Um, what he means by that, and he means that more from an executive level as how he runs a company. He means think big. 
he means I'm going to con congratulate myself, but we need to do more. There's always work to do. And that goes again to complacency. And I've always equated that to even my, my career or every aspect of my life is if I find myself in complete, being complacent, that means I'm not growing and I'm not learning. If I'm not taking a risk, I'm not going to have reward. And if anyone knows me personally, I have the most non-conventional path there is to where I am. And that's because of the risk taking and that part of taking a risk also means failure. But in order to mitigate that failure, one, you must learn from it, know that it's a seed planted that will grow slowly over, over time. So that's how it definitely relates to investing, but it's also calculated risks as well. Um, so lots we can learn from Tom, but those are just some of the quotes we pulled out. Otherwise, got some great, great options information. Now, on to Rick. Um, he's got some lovely quotes as well. And I discussed these and approved them with him before this presentation earlier today. Um, if you were on our market playbook a while ago and Rick was on, or when we talked about um, his approach, I'm going to start with the bottom one because this one blew my mind. He said, Your process isn't the right process if it's consistently losing. Something needs to change. And that's really great. And what I think is interesting, and when the first time I went into sales training um, at a firm, and they're all the same, I went into sales training at Scott Trade Fidelity and Merrill, they all taught the same thing, which is true, is taking the emotion out of investing and coming up with a disciplined approach. And that simply means you make those calculated decisions. But if you say, okay, I'm going to buy this stock, but if I make 20%, I'm going to sell it. And if I lose 10%, I'm also going to sell that. Do that in a consistent basis, then you have that distribution curve and then you have success. That has always been a part of any type of investment advisors training of so. But that's also how they sell you a mutual fund that does that for you. And it's a passive type of investment. And those are certainly intended for those who don't have the time, the will or the skill to start with the trading. But if you're here, you're, you, you want to trade essentially. Um, second quote is a contrarian finds opportunity in going against consensus thought, a successful contrarian maximizes that opportunity with a proven process and proper timing. Um, so that goes again to calculated decision-making and utilizing those tools and resources that you have. There are endless amounts of market commentary on the internet. If you are on a self-directed brokerage firm, they're all free to you as a self-directed investor. It's amazing the amount of information that's there. And I was always dumbfounded when talking to clients when they didn't realize the wealth of information that is on their brokerage firm sites. At Options Play, really our goal and what we do is we fill the gap of what they cannot have from a regulatory perspective. We make sure that we offer that. Um, and we also keep it regulatory friendly as well, but it's just more quick to market information, if you will. So we have Rick who came from Morgan Stanley and has a huge amount of knowledge that we can all learn from that gives us market direction and trade ideas and that contrarian approach with his process and proper timing. But that doesn't mean you can't apply that to your trading strategy as well. And that's where I'd love to call it failing upward. And that's even something I, I, I teach my son. It's important to talk about resilience and that defines your process. I love to ask my son, it's something new I started maybe about a year ago is, hey, what'd you fail at today? And what that does is it opens, it welcomes failure, but it allows us to talk through opportunity and how we can grow. And it welcomes that that's okay. So he won't give up. And what I'm doing is teaching him resilience. And I relate it all to investing because it's who I am, but I think it, it's so applicable is accepting failure when you don't have something right, but knowing that you did your homework because this is what happens with the market. The market experiences a huge amount of volatility with unseen, unforeseen events. Think about the market today. We, the Fed, admitted it, said, we called this wrong. Inflation is astronomically high. The key contributor, two of them, to inflation, number one was 
energy, really high rising energy cost. Well, guess what? No one accounted for, no strategist was the Russia-Ukraine war and the supply chain constraints. So that's an uncertain event. That is absolutely going to mean that you're wrong because that's not something you could foresee when you do your homework. Um, and then the third component for that high inflation was the really record low unemployment. You know, that on the surface seems amazing, but companies have had to raise wages in order to attract workers that trickle down to the product, and then all of a sudden it goes up. Um, so that is things that you can't account for. But what you can do is do your homework on that company, knowing if they're healthy. And if you don't want to do that, like I said, you can just simply use an analyst rating. Um, and then that really equates to investing. And there's so many analogies we can make. But when you when you buy a stock, and right now, I think every person that I see on CNBC, including myself, will say, looking for healthy profit margins and high and increasing earnings per share. And what that means is, is if you have a healthy profit margin, that just means that the money that you're spending and the money that you're making, there's a room for cash. And that's good because if interest rates go up, the cost to borrow goes down, so you're, you have a cushion. And that equates to our savings accounts is we make sure we have a cushion and risk aversion is having a cushion um, and earnings per share is just our growth. So you can you can really or your income and constantly making sure that that goes up as well. And we and if that's not happening by your employer, that's how investing comes into play and a way that we can grow our wealth. So having that process is really important. But in addition to that, it's doing your homework on that process and making sure it's consistent with your values and with the market. So let's talk about what that means. Um, pulling this chart again, there is interesting studies about mindset. So if I were to put a screen on top of this, you may say, okay, I'm gonna start investing now because I know I need to do it early and often due to compound interest. And so, um, and if you don't know the difference between compound interest and simple interest, I definitely encourage you to Google that. But that simply means is when you make interest, you reinvest it and it's going to go up astronomically over time and time is your friend in that type of scenario. But it's how you grow something small, really, really large and the purpose of all type of investing. But if you were to start that early and if you were to take away this entire chart, this looks like a mistake right here. You would get into this. You say, I'm, I'm, I'm into the market. They did that early 2000 and then all of a sudden the dot-com bubble happened. And yeah, that, that looks pretty poor and that's terribly unfortunate. However, if you still reinvested dividends or reinvested or added $20 a week even to your portfolio, your dollar cost averaging down and you still would have ended up at some point making quite a bit of money. So these look like mistakes and they will. And when you are in the mistake zone or in the fear zone, and I literally want you to think about times in your life where you were like, I can't, this is, I'm done with this. Um, it's really hard to get out of that mindset, but that mindset is always going to cost you. Um, traders, I, I put it here, are wary of financial failure. And you feel like if you make a mistake, that's going to have long-term negative effects, in which case you, you, you're in reality are missing out on opportunity. And that's applicable now. There are a lot of people who came into the market post um, COVID or it, it always happens. I remember talking to clients so many times. I said, you know what? I don't want to relive OA. I lost my entire retirement. And they tend to sell at these times and then buy here, which is still something you can do, but that, that locks in losses and it mitigates the purpose and we'll talk about how to how to get your mind in the right mindset there and be engaged. But being emotional or relying, and I hate utilizing the word emotion, but taking out calculation or feeling like you have to follow the trend, because that's what that is, is following the trend by thinking that's a mistake. You are, you may lose out on opportunity and you tend to find opportunity um, is a lonely place, and then you're going to be on the other side of something most of the time. But that's something that's really in common with the pioneers that we called out and the disruptors is calculated risk taking. And I think that's what's important. And a huge component of it is doing your homework. And that's why at Options Play, 
all of our education is free as well. That's extremely important and something that I value and why I, why I joined the company. So let, let's talk about putting that all together. And I'm calling it get engaged. Like I said, being, being passive is certainly has its time and place, but it's a 40 and 50 year um, moment. It's setting something in your 401k and letting it be. Being active, trying to time the market and day trading. It's going to take a lot of your time. Um, something that people can certainly do. However, um, it's not realistic. But getting engaged, that means knowing what is around you and making calculated decisions. So I lay these out as number one is get your head in the game. It's very proud that I made a sports term for those who know me. But essentially what that means is risk and success go hand in hand and investing means volatility. So not only are you risking money when you go into the stock market, you are also risking the um, opportunity or excuse me, volatility coming your way, which is going to happen with the stock market because of those unanticipated events, it reacts. And sometimes it's a knee jerk reaction and things tend to fall down the stairs, but you have to climb back up. So getting your head in the game means using your head. I've got it should be, I've said this so many times, but calm, collected, and calculated, defining your process absent of emotion. So it's sticking to your process. And I will tell you personally, every time, every time I've lost on a trade, it's because I, I, I'm like, oh yeah, if I looked at, at Apple, I know this is fine. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and buy this call or, or do whatever. And I didn't do my homework. And when I don't do my homework, I lose out every single time because I have a process and I brought emotion back in. And that will just take it away. That means I, I don't have a calculated decision. And that's extremely important. Second is lose a battle, win the war. I say that all the time. Um, focus on your long-term strategy and create a positive risk reward profile. So you'd have to be calculated and strategic when you're placing a trade. You have to, and what this means is by creating a positive risk reward profile, and this is the way we position our trades at Options Play as well. Say you've got, got three trades and you are spending $500 to make $1,500. That's a positive risk reward. So if I have three of those trades, I'm going to break even, but I can make three times more than what I spent. And that's the purpose of a positive risk reward profile is if I do that often enough, and reinvest and grow that amount, that's going to grow over time. Um, you're, you will not profit on every trade. That's just inevitable. That's the way it is. Um, it's, it's great when we're all in a bull market and, you, and we're all making money, but it doesn't necessarily happen 100% of the time. And that's trading. There's different when you just buy a stock and let it sit there and write a covered call against it or, or like really conservative things are certainly helpful. Either way, Rational risk-taking will grow your account over time. And that simply means even just starting investing. I'll talk about options because this is options play, but again, this is applicable to everything. Um, the second is mistakes are growth opportunities. Optimistic narratives are slow to grow and pessim pessimistic fall quickly. And this is where there's so many studies on mindset where optimistic narratives sound like sales tactics where people say, oh yeah, things are gonna get better. Actually, anytime I've gone through anything in my life and someone says, oh, it's okay, things will get there. I'm, I'm, like, you don't wanna hear it. It sounds like something that someone's trying to say to make you feel better. It's not gonna happen very quickly. However, pessim pessimism, everyone is very quickly to fall on that. With people, when they talk about them, they're like, oh, I just see what that girl did. Like they, everyone bands together. And that happens with the market. Yeah, we're going down, we're going down. And that like, you want to get on that train. And what I'm trying to say is that optimistic narrative tends to be a little less um, traveled, but it's also slower and more lucrative. And that's what's important. And that's where your mindset is, is where you say, okay, I didn't do well on this trade, if you're trading, or I, I, this didn't work out the way that I planned. However, let me re reassess the situation oh, okay, I didn't educate myself here. I didn't know that this was a component. Let's make sure that I understand that and then apply that next time. That's how it's a growth opportunity. 
you must fall forward to get ahead. I love to say that. And again, another thing I say to my son, I, I teach my son a lot of weird things, um, but that is very true is if you accept that you are going to fail, but you also accept that you're going to learn from it, then you will be resilient, in which case you will get back up and you will try again. And that's really important with trading is resiliency, but having a really good calculated process and doing your homework. And that's what we try to do at Options Play is this is where our whole strategy is actually formulated around. We just sometimes don't give you a peek behind the curtain because there is a few of us sometimes doing just a ton of stuff, and but we all love it. And that that's really great. But we focus on shifting our strategy this way or our strategy is this way and that's important the daily trades that you get have a positive risk reward profile they are set up in a way because we have rick to do a contrarian approach um and so they're designed to think this way the asset allocation and risk tolerance however is absolutely on you but we've built calculators to help you with that but whether you are trading purely stocks or options or the market overall and being super conservative, this is so applicable to every aspect of investing or even your life. Um, so I hope this, this certainly helped or at least inspired you to get trading. Um, as always, we do wanna let you know that if you haven't signed up for Options Play, it is a 30 day free trial. Um, you do get access to that global macro research by Rick. He sends out something every Monday. And then we also have, um, the Macro Monday Technical Outlook with him on Mondays as well. So lots, lots of information there is from a macro research perspective. You get those daily trading signals I was talking about um, and ideas overall. And there's lots of education and lots of tools and resources that we've really built for you on options play and that we're constantly building because we are one of those disruptors, if you will. So that's it for our presentation today. Um, I am happy to take some questions if you'd like. Um, so let's go from there. I see the chat going off and, and sometimes it's hard for me to read it all at once, but let me see what I can find. All right. Um, as always, the, the if you signed up for the video or the this webinar, our um, marketing team, Philip, who's on the call, will make sure that you have it sent out into your email. Normally, it's around 7.30, 8 o'clock where that will come out. So the replay will, replay will be available. And then we also post them on YouTube afterwards as well. Um, Peter, you said, I hear you say that you ask that you use MACD to make decisions on your trade. I've tried to look you up on YouTube between this, those are the... Um, I would love to do one on technical analysis. <laughs> um, Little secret, Peter, if you go to Meryl's website, I did one with Tony a while ago and you can find a technical analysis series there on Meryl's website. But uh, yeah, MACD is a technical indicator that I use and that's just a starting point. So that's part of my process um, because of the way the moving average works. It um, doesn't, it's not evenly distributed. It places weight on more recent prices, it's an EMA. So what that means is there is a signal where things flip upwards, but that's just an indication to investigate more, not anything you should solely rely on, but that's a, a peek into my process, if you will. Um, there's a question about portfolio size. If it's larger, is it better than 1% or the 2% rule? Um, that is your personal risk tolerance. If your options portfolio is larger, but if that's your overall savings account, then I would definitely stick to that. Um, but if it's something where you've got a diverse asset allocation as in far as far as where your assets are, then you can your risk tolerance is something that makes you more comfortable. Okay. That one. Um, Belly, if you said you have a strategy that you want to talk to someone about, you can send an email to info at optionsplay.com. That normally goes over to Phil again, who's on this call or, or um, someone else on our customer service team. If you say one of our names, they, nine times out of 10, they, they end up on our desk as well. So we'll, we'll talk about it together and get you a really good answer. So if you have questions on that, feel free to just send an email to info at optionsplay.com. Um, you want to know if options play can help me choose the right call option rolling a covered call. Um, yeah, that's what the purpose of the platform 
is set up for. There's a portfolio feature where you put in that covered call, you can actually analyze the risk versus reward when you're trying to roll it, which is important. We have a whole webinar on what that's on as far as managing covered calls, but rule of thumb, one, when you're rolling it, that's a bullish strategy. So please still be bullish on this security. We normally prioritize capital appreciation over income. So that's just the, where your stock can go up to your strike price and then look for a point to Delta. And a point to Delta just means that it will expire 20. It's a 20% chance that it will expire worthless, which is your goal. Um, credit set suggestions. There is no vol or open interest. Why the suggestion? So the algorithm prioritizes um, premium received on that. And whenever you see something with little liquidity, that's why we built the liquidity ranking. But that's what the purpose of a limit order is, is to protect your execution. So if you're, you're trading options, you're trading stock, if anything has a really wide bid or ask, a spread of some sort, um, or little volume, if you put in a limit order, that means you're gonna accept it at this price and that's it. If it's any higher, it won't execute. So that protects your price if you feel like there isn't a lot of volume for you to get a good price. Um, I love this question, Maria. What are the best technical analysis indicators to use? Um, so the way I always answer that is technical analysis indicators fall into a couple of different categories. So there is momentum, overbought, oversold, resistance and support levels, those that follow trend. So it's finding something within those categories that you like and you understand. If you haven't used technical analysis before, I always give the most common used indicators, which is Bollinger Bands. That's the first one I ever learned back in 2009. Um, MACD and RSI. At Options Play, we also use CCI in the Ichimoku Cloud. Love those. Um, but also, a lot of uh, your brokerage firm software probably does the hard work for you, and Options Play does as well, where it just literally says bullish bearish based on technical analysis. And we plot, plot the resistance and support line. Um, but those are great places to start with those. Um, the daily playlist that goes to your email automatically every day. If you don't see it, check your junk folder. Um, but on the options play platform, it's under the watch list and portfolio. Um, technical tips on the horizon. All right, that one down. We can do that. Yeah, I agree with stagflation. <laughs> Some great information in here. Emotions definitely come. All right, so that's, that's nine more messages that come in. Um, all right, one more. Um, could you highlight what it's mean to doing your homework for a potential trade? So everyone has a different process. Um, and mind you, when I share mine, that may be different from options play as well. Um, but no, when I do my homework for a potential trade, it depends on the market mechanics as well. So I really like to balance macro versus micro. And what that means is one, I'm very data heavy. And I really, really, really like to look at history if you've attended any of our my sessions, I tend to talk about that all the time. But that really equates to me um, understanding backtesting and performance and how things react to similar instances over time and then extrapolating that data. So knowing the macro headwinds is simply what I stated earlier, knowing it's a high inflation environment, know what the market wants in regard to interest rates and what will impact it, what caused that inflation, and then watching those things to come down and what impacts those the most. So that's step number one. Um, when finding a stock, sometimes it's around an idea. So for example, the um, Inflation Reduction Act, a portion of that included clean energy and tax incentives, then diving deeper into that. So that's a great example of macro. 
And then diving deeper into that, so the tax incentives were only applicable to domestically produced and there was other things in there as well. So then you'd screen for securities that would fit that model and lots of um, brokerage firms have that screener. Um, if it's sector-based and options play, it's super easy. You can just pull the sectors. Um, and then from there, I'll do my technical analysis and fundamental analysis and do like PE comparisons and things like that. And we'll definitely make more on that. This I, I said that very quickly to walk through my process. I feel like it would take an hour, um, but we certainly can at some point. Um, but the purpose, I will say, of options play all together and a lot of what your brokerage firm already offers you is doing just that and doing the heavy lifting for you. Know that I literally do this for a living, um, including the education aspect. So therefore I take the time to do all of that. All right. Okay, so um, we went a little bit over. I appreciate all the kind of remarks that I see in there. Um, different type of session that we have done. I did see somebody say, what are your most successful trader yours? Mine were the ones that said being engaged and having a process. I wrote those, um, but we can certainly have more. But if you have anything else that you wanna see, please let us know. Um, if we didn't answer the answer your questions, again, info at optionsplay.com. Really appreciate the time and everyone who attended. Um, thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day.